18 years old at the time. Michael was, uh, was my best friend. We had actually met as kids uh, on a Little League field. So we had known each other since we were approximately about eight years old. We were pretty much inseparable. We noticed uh, an individual lounging uh, on the back of the car next to uh, where we had parked. As we started approaching the Jeep, this individual started to um, approach us. And pretty much when he came eye to eye with us, he looked us dead in the eye, put his head down, and continued walking. Um, and I remember Michael saying to me, that seems kind of odd. We got into uh, the Jeep, and as I went with my left hand to reach across to grab the seatbelt, um, the door opened up, and the next thing I knew, I had a gun shoved in against my side. I was directed to get in the back of the Jeep. He told us he was gonna take the Jeep, and he was just gonna tie us up long enough for him to get away, because he didn't want to get caught. He was taking us in, in, in areas where I never, never even knew in my 18 years of living um, in the county. The whole time that we're driving, the gun is against Michael. It's being held low so that anybody, any passersby can't see it. The thought went through my mind that a Jeep seat it has a lever under the bottom where if you, if I could have moved my foot underneath, lifted it up and just pushed it forward, you know. But at the same time though, thinking that, okay, well, what if I get my friend killed? Each area that we were taken to, one was more deserted um, than the other. That was only the, the, the third and final destination that we were told to get out of the car. He said, okay, he goes, well, you guys cooperated. He goes, so now I want you to walk behind this pile of wood chips. This area that we were in, it was a was a, a field that was being cleared and there was evergreens all around. So we were pretty much uh, camouflaged from the road. So any passersby couldn't really see us. He then tells us, okay, I want both of you to lay face down in the snow with your hands behind your back and don't look at me. Michael was pleading, he goes, we did what you asked. He's like, you said you weren't gonna hurt us. He goes, shut up and, and listen to what I say. And I'm watching Michael this whole time as I'm laying next to him, maybe not even a foot away from him. And I hear the last words hear the last words to come out of my friend's mouth I was please don't do this I have a mother I have a sister and then bang shot him square in the back of his head I'm watching this the whole time I'm not supposed to, my face is supposed to be in the snow and not looking at this And now it's, it's, it's really starting to set in that this is it, it's over. And again, I could only think of how worried my mother was gonna be. And um, he, he then points the gun at me and he tells me, I told you not to look. I told you to keep your face in the snow. He's walking around me and straddling over me. Now I'm waiting for him to just reach down and shoot me. I was more or less waiting to die and It seemed like it was taking forever. At the same time though, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm kind of at peace because I'm with my best friend. You know, I'd be going with my best friend. I'm, I'm not gonna be alone. And, um, you know, I started thinking about all the things that I accomplished in my 18 years. Uh, you know, I, I knew what it was like to hit the game winning home run. I knew what it was like to throw a no hitter. I was a bat boy for the New York Yankees. So I achieved my goal of being a Yankee. Um, I made my mother proud, my father proud, uh, my sister, my family. Uh, and this, all of a sudden, it was, I could see like this book just like laid out and just saw from the front pages being thumbed and from birth and kind of like all the highlights in, in my life. And then all of a sudden, the pages went blank and then that's when I felt it and I heard it bang 
At that last moment, I turned my head. I heard the bang and felt the impact of the bullet. And instead of getting shot square in the back of the head like Michael was, I got shot right in the back of my head behind my ear. The bullet came in and went out the side of my face. I just heard ringing and, and, and then like just throbbing. Then I heard the, uh, the Jeep start up and I then looked over the pile of wood chips again and saw the Jeep start driving away. I checked on Michael and I got a couple of faint moans from him. So he wasn't dead, he wasn't dead. Uh, he, he, he was still alive, but um, unresponsive. So um, I, I tried to collect myself and looked around the area that we were in and noticed that uh, in the distance across the street, um, there were these white buildings. I ran, uh, I got up and, and I ran across the street and was banging on the doors saying, please, please, you gotta help. And I remember seeing my reflection in the window of, of the door and like, oh, oh, oh my, there was a, a, a man working there. They called 911 right away. Later on that, that evening when I'm in my hospital room with my mother and my father uh, and my sister um, was when I had found out that Michael had passed. And I remember just crying, being confused, being angry, um, not understanding why the same guardian angel that was looking after me wasn't looking after him. I'm trying to process that I'm never gonna be able to, to, to talk to my friend, to see him again, you know, to tell him that I love him. Thank him, thank him for, for being my best friend. It's not fair. I survived because at that last second, I turned my head. And if I didn't go with my inner instinct, that, that, that inner voice, what I consider to be my guardian angel being there for me, if I didn't listen to that voice, I don't think I would have been here today. And because of that, I survived.